Good afternoon to uh, everyone here in the Boston area and welcome uh, to the August 21st Peer Insight where we'll be discussing harnessing crowd wisdom for the future of virtualization. I'm uh, very excited today to be joined by Noemi Graysdorf, who is a VP of Strategy uh, for uh, Cambridge Computing Services, Computer Services. Um, we also will have today Nathan Smith, Senior Citric Engineer at uh, Centered Networks, uh, Joachim Hepner, who is Senior Manager at Sanofi, um, as well as um, Duncan Epping and Frank Deneman from VMware. And, um, and John Blumenthal from, um, from Cloud Physics. So, uh, so the title for today's uh, Peer Insight, Harnessing Crowd Wisdom for the Future of Virtualization, is really all about bringing a, a big data approach to analyzing VMware environments and making them easier to manage. Um, just a couple of logistics before we get started. Um, remember that it's a uh, pound, uh, sorry, star six to mute the line. Is that right? Yeah, star six to mute and star six to unmute your line. If you're not speaking, please mute your line so that we don't have feedback on the line. Um, and um, if we will be pausing throughout the uh, peer insight uh, to give uh, folks on the line an opportunity to ask questions of our participants today. So with that, let me get started. Um, I want to start with you, Nathan. Uh, Nathan, again, thanks for joining us. Senior Citrix Engineer at uh, Centered Networks. Uh, Nathan, first, uh, tell us a little bit about your environment. Um, so we are, um, we provide hosted virtual desktops and hosted applications. Um, our environment is about 95% virtualized, um, and it's a blend of VMware and Zen server and we uh, host on NetApp storage. Okay. So and and t tell me a little bit about some of the problems that you've been trying to solve on the management side. Um, I don't know if it's management necessarily, but where we've run into a lot of issues is um, trying to make sure our performance is good and we meet our SLAs. Um, we've run into some issues with the root cause analysis of um, performance problems in general, but specifically when we get down to the VM storage level, uh, we were finding we had a, a kind of blind spot there where we could, you know, we had a feeling that we were heading towards the right direction, but once we started looking for some data on VM storage, we had a bit of a blind spot. We could see from the um, Windows guest OSs that things were fine, and the NetApp performance advisor was always also telling us things were good but we couldn't really understand how the hypervisor was viewing the storage. And that's where we started um, working with Cloud Physics to try and get some metrics around that and then also be able to interpret those metrics in a, a useful way. What were some of the metrics that you were able to capture using Cloud Physics that you couldn't capture before? Um, I'd have to defer to someone to, from Cloud Physics to really get into the details, but they were um, vSCSI statistics, um, and one of the advantages to us of working in this way, kind of utilizing other people's knowledge and experience as well as other people's data, is that we were able to get some relatively simple views of some very complex um, numbers. So the way that when we were working with Cloud Physics, it was presented back to us, kind of simplified a lot of that, which is why I don't have a very clear view of the specifics. I just know the way it was interpreted. I was able to get a feel for, uh, in more kind of layman's terms, whether our storage was in a good place or a bad place. So what did you do as a result of the analysis? Um, at this point, we haven't done anything differently. Um, we're still working through it. It's obviously in this kind of process and this uh, approach is in its very early stages. Um, so we're still working closely with Cloud Physics to try and drill in a little further um, to, to figure out what we can do to improve things. Uh, Jakob, um, can you describe your environment there at Sanofi? Yeah, 
So uh, we are a VMware-based environment with all VMware as far as virtualization goes with uh, EMC storage. Uh, the environment uh, today is roughly 70% virtualized globally. Okay. And what kinds of challenges are you, were you having, are you having in your environment? Well, I think, again, for me, uh, in my opinion, just going forward in the future, we're going to have to start looking at things a little differently, especially when we start look at, looking at cloud-based computing, uh, all, all the appliances that are out there. Um, you know, again, these are things that are going to change the way we manage the platform. Um, just as a reminder for those on the call today, if you could please mute your line if you're not speaking, it would be helpful. Uh, star six to mute. Hello, this is Kim. I'm not in the office right now, but if you'd like Again, star six to mute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and Kim, uh, hope you get back in the office soon. Um, <laughs> so, um, so are you sending data up then to uh, to cloud physics? How does that work? Yes. So we just started doing. We just started participating in the beta program, and we've been sending our data for about a month now. Okay. And one of, one of the things that's always sensitive in corporations is sending data about your environment off-site. I'm curious as to how you. Uh, how you approach that? Who had to be involved in your in your organization to sort of make decisions regarding um, sending your environment data um, to a third party? All right. So we looked at what our current policies have, and uh, we we've actually already participated in something similar. We were part of the V Benchmark program from VMware, um, so we've done something similar in the past. Uh, so again, looking at what uh, cloud physics uh, actually collects. They don't collect any local or sensitive information. It's basically just performance stats coming out of vCenter, uh, which is fine. Okay. And and can, do you control access to that data, or or um, or uh, or does it just uh, you you've decided up front what data you you're going to send, and it just goes. Right. We we. Based on the account we used for the privileges, uh, we, we didn't give it admin rights. Uh, so again, it's, it's using some basic privileges to collect the information, just enough to collect the information it needs and send it up to cloud physics. Uh, Duncan, you've been acting as an advisor to cloud physics well, uh, in the context of your role at VMware. Um, um, how, does, um, how, are you, how is VMware and how is cloud physics working together? Duncan? Star six to unmute. Sorry, I, was, <laughs> I was being unmuted at the moment. Uh, yeah. I'm indeed an advisor for, uh, for cloud physics, um, but that's, that's more from a uh, community slash blogging perspective. Okay. And uh, it has been my primary focus, uh, at least from working together with cloud, cloud physics to give uh, early product feedback and product direction. And I guess that uh, what I've been focusing on most is the uh, the community aspect of things, uh, the usability of the product, and uh, the potential of the data set itself. Hey, allora, il Daniele. Pronti, Michetti? Uh, um, uh, Noemi, you've got some experience here with cloud physics as well. Can you yep. talk a little bit about that? Um, one of the reasons that I sort of started getting involved with cloud physics and having those conversations is um, a lot of our customers uh, who are running relatively large VMware environments are struggling um, to identify performance um, bottlenecks to really get, um, as I think it was Nathan who mentioned, um, really getting down to the um, smallest increment in terms of what the, um, the automated self service directory what the environment is doing in order to um, optimize it in order to get better performance in order to support more applications in virtualized environment and so we have had um, cloud physics introduced to to a number of our customer accounts uh, in order to help them sort of get um, a better understanding of what's happening. Um, I have not yet talked to a single account where there aren't um, either challenges in managing storage in virtualized environment, or um, who are 
who are not in need. So everybody needs something um, to either troubleshoot what they already have, to plan for the future, or to get um, a better understanding of where they are based on where they want to go. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that uh, we've been looking at is, is how introducing changes into the environment have impact the overall environment. So there's been a lot of discussion regarding SSDs and impact of SSDs in VMware environments. Um, uh, yep. Can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective, what you've seen? So um, th there is a sense to some extent in the marketplace that if you have SSD or SSD is the answer to all your problems. So if you put an SSD, it automatically solves your performance uh, challenges, especially in the VMware environment. Um, we're finding in, uh, through conversations with customers that oftentimes adding uh, SSD into the environment, um, cask the, you solve one problem, the bottleneck moves elsewhere. Uh, that's always the case, but when you're adding something that is so exponentially faster than what we have today, the hard disk drives, um, that bottleneck um, can be significant and cause significant issues. So it's, you can't just uh, blindly put an SSD to accelerate the performance and expect that the rest of the ecosystem is going to function um, perfectly well. There's, you're going to either in the long term or in a very short term, more likely, run into bottlenecks along the data path, whether it's in primary storage, whether it's in data protection, replication, or something else. So I think one of the hopes here, using a using a, a data analytics approach to to managing uh, VMware in, environments, is that you can benefit from the experience of other. Uh, users who've gone before you and tried similar things. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what you see there? So it's a combination. Um, in the presentations that I've sat through uh, with Cloud Physics to the end users, it definitely resonates the idea that, you know, somebody out there in the large VMware community is doing, uh, it is either implementing SSDs or implementing a slew of storage systems that we have on the marketplace are doing something um, that is relevant uh, to you. And so having that feedback loop is very, very valuable to them. Also being able to uh, post um, questions to a large data set um, is very valuable. What's really valuable about that is the fact that it's sort of anonymous. Um, anonymity is, is a big issue for many organizations, especially if you get into um, government, a lot of research labs. Um, they're, they're very conscious um, uh, of the security issues. Uh, even though they're only collecting operational data, there's still some, uh, some issues around security. The other part of cloud physics that I think is valuable or is interesting is that you know, there always has to be somebody who's first, right? Um, if, if you're the follower, then there's plenty of people who have done um, certain things that you can take a lesson from it and implement in your environment or use it to troubleshoot your environment. But if, if you're the first one trying to do something, um, like, um, you know, when vSphere 5 came out, if mm -hmm. you were going to migrate to that, you don't necessarily have the experience of the crowd to leverage to see how to do it or what the best practice or what are going to be the gotchas. But the information that is collected um, by cloud physics inherently is also useful to model and to understand sort of what might be the gotchas in your environment as you try to implement certain things. Yeah. Uh, Duncan and Frank, I know you have both been involved in looking at high availability. You've written extensively on the subject of high availability. Um, um, and and uh, often when we make changes in an environment, it, it impacts uh, high availability. Can you talk a little bit about what you are uh, hoping to see out of this sort of big data approach to, um, to analyze environments and, and, and improving high availability uh, as there changes? Uh, well, one of the, the uh, things of big data is that we can actually validate if our best practices or the industry best practices are actually uh, applied. And uh, we can also see that um, if, if other uh, settings are more common in, 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 in the most environments. So, so essentially set, uh, identifying the best practices um, across a, a large community of environments and understanding which of those are 
able to maintain high availability? Yeah, let me add to that. Another thing that we're working on with cloud physics is uh, specific simulation models uh, for HA and DRS clusters. And those would basically allow you to, uh, to try out changes in your environment without actually introducing them in your production environment. So uh, that's a very effective way of seeing how a specific change uh, to your environment can actually improve the, uh, the resiliency or, uh, for instance, improve the availability of, of, of workloads, but also uh, the availability of resources. Um, you're right. And, and, and I know for most IT shops, they're relatively thinly staffed, and they don't have a lot of time to do uh, uh, proof of concept. So anything that will shorten that cycle is, uh, is a huge benefit, um, identifying uh, identifying what might uh, improve the environment uh, before you actually uh, implement it in a, in a uh, what can be very expensive uh, POC. Uh, expensive not only for the customer, but expensive for the suppliers. There's also a significant value um, in comparing different offerings in the marketplace more um, comprehensively. Um, you could identify and create a um, a, a workload set and then you can give that workload set specific to your environment um, to the various vendors and have them even run it in their lab because it's um, you know th there's there's the conversation around you know we handle sequential loads well or we handle random workloads well large file small file large block small block um, but every environment has a different mix um, of, of those uh, different parameters. So actually capturing a workload and making it possible for a vendor to test that workload against their um, system gives the customer some kind of, it, it empowers them because uh, when the vendor then gives you the configuration, it's the configuration that they should have tested and that says exactly it's going to work for your workload and this is what you're going to get out of it versus um, what a lot of times happens today um, there are some basic calculations that may happen in terms of how many IOPS or how much latency you're going to have on a system. And then when you actually implement the system, it may or may not give you that mm -hmm. because, again, uh, the variability of workloads are significant across environments. Uh, John Blumenthal, I'll give you a second to unmute your line, but I'm, I'm interested to hear from you. Again, John is the CEO of Cloud Physics. I'm interested to hear uh, from you that how much data you're actually going to collect? <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, right now we have uh, 50 working data sets um, that we're using for aggregation. Um, the number this week is climbing incredibly given the launch of our website. Yeah, you just, um, came, out of, you just came out of stealth mode yesterday, right? So We did. Um, <coughs> we were working with uh, larger data sets, mainly to prime the back end of our system to start understanding how to load balance it. Um, now we have, uh, or we're in the process of onboarding um, nearly a hundred uh, of what we call observers. These are virtual appliances that are the data collection mechanisms <coughs> that users download as an OVF and simply install. And from there, anonymization um, occurs before the data is chipped up to our, uh, our cluster that we run uh, as our back end. <laughs> so uh, the total data set um, has grown into um, the hundreds of terabytes already. We're actually um, using uh, aggregations of data that we've been collecting uh, over the course of the last uh, year while we've been um, operating in stealth mode. Uh, to test a lot of the analytics uh, that we've been writing and <coughs> some of the cards or small applications that uh, you can see on our site currently, especially things related to high availability that Duncan and Frank have helped us Again, uh, star six, if you can mute your lines if you're not speaking, I'd appreciate it. Um, the, I've seen a number of mentions of cards. Can you talk a little bit about what cards are and, and, and what that means to the community? Yeah, so cards are our visual metaphor that uh, represents the user experience and orientation of our product, our service approach. Um, our service is a task-oriented approach where users um, 
can uh, derive very specific benefits from uh, applying a car to a very specific problem. And our, our service is not meant to manage or necessarily uh, provide real-time monitoring of a, of a system. There are plenty of solutions like that in the marketplace. And nearly all the solutions in the marketplace are focused on uh, kind of an inventory-oriented uh, approach where um, you are presented with the environment and the environment is navigated by the end user to find an object on which to operate or execute a task. Um, our entry point is more task-oriented where the user comes to cloud physics with a specific problem. The problem is rendered or represented as a card, as a narrowly focused uh, uh, tool, and you, you use that card to apply it, uh, a specific solution to that problem. Um, in this challenge that we have hosted this week uh, prior to the um, you can see hundreds of cards that have been uh, suggested in ways that are actually quite remarkable and representative of the power of the community. Um, literally, there, there are hundreds of these things already just in the 48 hours that we've been live that describe um, very specific problems that products today just uh, don't address or render. And it's our ambition to continuously provide uh, end users with these uh, ongoing <coughs> And as a consequence of this ongoing community involvement in the development and delivery of these solutions, yeah. this very <coughs> massive data set will arise. Uh, wait, uh, my, what? Hey, again, if you're not speaking, please press star six to mute Hi. your line. Um, which one is my... Ex no, is it on the show? Like Excuse me. Uh, anyone on the call who's not speaking, uh, please mute your line, star six. Um, so, uh, I want to I want to pause here for a moment and uh, see if there are any questions from the community. Okay. Um, so, hi, hi, John. Yeah. Uh, this is Mike Alvarado. I did have one hey, question. Mike. If there is a view into aggregating resources or making available a uh, some kind of shared model um, where resources are actually tapped into. John, can you uh, answer that question? Yes, that's a great question. Um, we have built um, and are in the process of implementing, uh, you'll see this very soon, a secure data sharing model that looks a lot like what you may have experienced in social networking already, um, where, for example, uh, with Google Circles, you can whitelist people to um, look at different portions of uh, what you've created as your profile and effectively your portion of the file system tree. Uh, similarly, what we are working on and will have already very soon at Cloud Physics is the ability for you to share a key with um, a third party. And that key can be revoked at any time. It can be expired. And the idea is that this third party can then render and view your environment in an uh, unmasked fashion. Um, and they could, if you wanted to, uh, look at the association of who you are with that um, unmasked view. But you, as the end user, have entire control of who views and who can access uh, your actual unmasked state of your data. Um, and the technique is actually very well known in the way that <coughs> social media works with privacy controls. Uh, so we've borrowed from that um, uh, very heavily to implement a very similar type of data sharing mechanism. We have a storage partner already um, who is using this uh, process uh, for the purposes of pre-sales. Um, and someone on the call today mentioned this already, where a vendor um, in uh, cooperation with the end user can request the key and allow for an analysis of an environment prior to um, sitting down with the end user to talk about their environment and um, 
the actual value proposition that a vendor's product might bring to that environment. In fact, the call today, um, uh, we hope in the very near future, uh, to work with Wikibon to deliver this type of data sharing mechanism such that participants in the call like uh, Nathan and Joachim could simply provide you, uh, the participants in the call, um, a temporary uh, access to look at their environment um, in a kind of schematic way for you to securely uh, review and analyze uh, what your environment might look like um, as a trusted third party. It's a core piece to what we're doing. It enhances and I think congeals a technical community um, and, and it's a core focus of what we're delivering. Mike, did that answer your question? You, any any follow up? Um, hi, this is David Sawyer. Um, I, I have a follow up question for that. Uh, obviously, the more people that you have in your database, or it seems it would seem logical to me, but the more lot people that you have in the database, uh, the the greater the uh, advice and information you can give out to your users. Um, is your business model is, is to uh, allow users to sell you the data and then a subset of those users to to purchase your services uh, uh, from that data? Yeah, that's it's a great question. Um, the, the power is really in the um, statistically meaningful size of the database, as you indicate. Um, our business model is really twofold. Um, the first is uh, to deliver directly to end users value through a subscription service uh, that is comprised of an ever increasingly rich set of cards, um, like the ones you see uh, on our site, as well as um, what has been suggested by the community. In fact, um, the, the idea here is that the community itself will be able to develop cards and uh, off of a platform uh, access that we'll be exposing uh, such that uh, third parties can develop their own cards, uh, somewhat like an app store in which these focused solutions could be distributed um, on an ongoing basis uh, for a variety of cloud type infrastructures. And then the second part of our business model is <laughs> focused on the product vendors uh, who are, are constructing and delivering products um, to those same end users uh, consuming our services. And so these product vendors uh, consume uh, really three types of um, modules that we've, we're putting online for the vendor community. One is a sales module uh, that increases the effectiveness of the sales force and customer satisfaction in the sales process. The other is a support module that uh, addresses the um, multi-vendor environment you typically find in, in a virtualized environment in a way that allows for uh, coordinated uh, reviews of a user's environment in a secure fashion using this data sharing technique I described earlier <clears throat> so that the time to resolution of a given problem um, is accelerated and the VMware admin is not left as an administrative assistant trying to schedule um, vendor uh, coordination and vendor calls. So that's our kind of two-pronged um, approach uh, to the fundamentals of our business. Um, and is the is the plan to expand this beyond a VMware environment? Is you covering Citrix as well, Hyper-V, um, non-virtualized environments? What's the plan? Yeah, I, our, because of the domain expertise of the team um, coming out of uh, VMware, um, but we also, uh, the other half of our team is actually uh, drawn from Google and a lot of the big data community in the Bay Area. Um, we are first and foremost focused on vSphere, uh, we will uh, be constructing data collection and analytics on other hypervisors, as well as uh, working with uh, several cloud, public cloud providers uh, that we're already engaged with. So the ability then um, to model your environment, understand your environment as you uh, extend it out into cloud uh, service providers? That's right. So the cloud, public cloud service providers have 
a variety of performance APIs um, that they expose for the purposes of monitoring um, uh, the performance of instances you uh, instantiate um, in EC2, for example. Um, what's critical, though, is <laughs> the ability to also understand what's happening behind uh, the virtualized veil that the uh, public cloud providers uh, provide access to. So um, we are in the process of engaging uh, several of these uh, larger scale public service providers to um, help with the modeling of how their back end physical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure responds to the demand coming from the logical side, from the virtualized side of their business. And this is David again, just good coming back on, on your business model. Um, again, this seems to emphasize the, the more uh, potential users you have, like uh, vendors and support people, that the more people you have in your system, the better. Uh, again, I was, I was asking specifically whether you were planning to pay people for um, uh, their information, even though they don't actually want your services. Oh, I see. Um, we haven't approached that type. We haven't approached that business model um, as as a way for generating a revenue stream. Instead, uh, the approach that we have uh, taken is to really create an eight um, very simple APIs into the expanding data set, um, so that by contributing um, to this independent platform you could also build uh, potentially your own business or your own product in many cases uh, off of the data that we're caretakers for um, as as an enablement platform. So it's a little bit it's a little bit the inverse of what you're asking. Instead of um, paying people for uh, the data stream, um, we instead take the data stream and, and place it in a way that would allow you to um, build a fundamental uh, um, uh, uh, application or report that would be of high value for others in the community uh, to consume either free or under a revenue sharing model that might arise from that. So, Yakim and Nathan, I'm interested if uh, I'm interested to hear from you if 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 you uh, feel like either Centered Networks or Sanofi will uh, will go down the path of trying to generate revenue from applications, or if we're really targeting a different uh, sort of customer here. Um, this is Nathan. I don't think for us we'd be looking to add revenue by using cloud physics. I think we would fit on the other side of the equation that John's talking about, where we look for value by using a subscription service and getting these um, very simplified views of a very complex environment with the added benefit that we're also uh, able to leverage other people's data to get, I guess, a more accurate view of how we're performing or how our environment is set up compared to other environments or um, best practices. And, and I suspect, uh, Yakum, that it, in, a, in, a, in a pharmaceutical company, the focus is going to be on uh, improving your uh, development of new medicines and not new apps. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So again, for us, it's going to be more about you know, maybe peer comparisons. Are we, you know, from an IT point of view, are we at the same cost model as, as let's say, one of the other competitors? Um, something along those lines. I could see it more useful in that category in the future. Yeah, the, you know, that's, it's interesting, uh, you know, if I roll it back 20 years ago or so, when I was on the customer side, we were, we looked at different benchmarking tools to see how we were compared to similar kinds of companies of similar size, but you couldn't do a direct comparison, you know, between uh, State Street Bank and Fidelity, for example, because neither company would want uh, the other to to um, have that kind of visibility. Um, what's, uh, what kinds of comparisons to other people's environments are you going to be able to provide, and what kind of protection are you going to be able to provide relative to, you know, I. I, I'm Target, and I don't really want Walmart to know what my environment looks like. John, yeah, that's for you. Right. Yeah, so this is Yaakov. I, I, are you asking us? Or? Oh, actually, I'll ask you, Yaakov. What, 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 
What about at Sanofi? I mean, you you probably don't want Merck uh, knowing a lot about what you're doing. Sure, but at a high level, that information is public, right? So in the Information Week 500 and all those you know other similar magazines, they do publish annual IT budgets. So you can kind of calculate your number based on the number of employees, uh, which we do today internally, right? We we always look at that. Okay. Uh, so it would be it would be interesting to see maybe some other information. Again, you know, everybody's different. Everybody uses it a different way. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you can gain one is more efficient than the other. I think from, from anything else, it might be more of a, okay, that's interesting. Now, now we understand where we sit in this, not so much, oh, we really got to get to that. Right. So it is, it is more important to sort of look at, uh, to satisfy your management that you're operating a very efficient environment. Um, and sure. relative to the yep. competition, um, but there's a lot of uh, variability in that from organization to organization in terms of their um, how risk averse they are, how conservative or or not, um, where their focus is in terms of IT. Um, you know how they manage their information. There's some things that are very standard, but there are some things that are very specific. Again, um, you know even if you take um, two research labs and their HPC environments. They could be all in life sciences, but they could be completely different workloads. Um, and how the data is stored and how the scientists are using the data is going to be very different. So the value of the aggregates is really more around the infrastructure and how do you optimize the infrastructure um, against the kind of workload. So it might actually, for Sanofi, might be more valuable for them to see or to compare themselves against somebody else who's running a similar infrastructure and it could be in a different um, industry mm -hmm. but they might be doing something that could help Sanofi um, improve either VM density or performance or whatever it is um, that they're trying to achieve. Yeah, so it's not just benchmarking against your industry peers but against the larger peer community. So it's good. Um, so let me throw it back to you John. What kinds of um, organizations do you imagine having an interest in developing the apps for the community that they might sell? Um, so I think this begins as, as we're already seeing um, as a grassroots uh, initiative um, within the, the a very active community that uh, Duncan and Frank are particularly uh, strong in their leadership. Um, I think it begins literally um, uh, you know, down at, at the four, at the people on the, the front lines of um, managing these systems. So it's really at the in, it's really at the individual level. Uh, you can imagine some individual deciding to, hey, I've got an idea here, and I've got a way to make some money. Um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, in a way, well, first of all, I think the community, and I, I would defer to Duncan to speak, he and Frank to speak authoritatively about this, but I believe. There's a heritage here that goes back to the Unix utility days where um, you have very focused uh, utilities that were the core philosophy of how you manage Unix back in the day, and that if you wanted to create something of uh, utilitarian value, um, you did that in a very narrow, focused way, and then people invented ways to pipe these things together to build increasingly rich solutions. I I've drawn from that um, that experience, and I think that uh, trend that led to a lot of success um, in managing open systems, and, and I see that happening in the community today. Um, I, I think Duncan or Frank could comment, I think, about um, the kind of demand and the nature of the community in terms of either um, looking at their work as a means of uh, deriving revenue or whether uh, there's more of the spirit of sharing and openness that I is driving uh, some of the things that we're already seeing at Cloud Physics. No, oh, good, Frank and Duncan. Why don't you why don't you flesh that out for us and give us some some of your perspective? How do you think it's going to play out? Is it going to become uh, uh, a charitable organization, a charitable approach, a big big open source group hug, or is it going to become uh, everybody um, uh, trying to trying to uh, build their own portfolio of uh, for fee apps. Well, let's hope that it's going to be a big open source group hack. That's what I would prefer. <laughs> um, um, 
by the looks of it, if I look at the uh, um, the current backend of Cloud Physics, and it's there, there's been many cards submitted already by the uh, uh, by the community, and I'm I'm guessing that it's going to be uh, it's going to be the same in the upcoming months. Uh, a, a lot of people actually see the value of this uh, of this platform, and we had some uh, early blogger calls, and uh, they all saw the value of this, and they also see where they could actually benefit from getting access to a data set like this. So they're all happy to uh, contribute to the platform. Uh, by uh, feeding in best practices or uh, some sort of monitoring, logging uh, reports. Uh, they're all really happy about uh, doing this. And I think Frank and I started uh, doing that with the uh, with the HA scorecard, which is already in there. And uh, Frank is currently actually working on a, a DRS scorecard. And that's also going to be a community effort. So uh, maybe Frank can explain uh, the, the part that he's working on. Yeah, Frank. So, uh, uh, like Duncan mentioned, the DRS scorecard. So one of the most brilliant things of this is that we can use the analysis of the program to actually understand that if you change a certain setting, for instance, a VM reservation, what, will, what impact does it have on the performance of the virtual machine? And if I change it, if I increase it, what will, what will happen? Not only to the performance of that virtual machine, but also on the rest of the ecosystem. And uh, like Duncan said, it should be a, a big group hug, and I think it's it's easily comparable to the Power CLI community in the environment. Everybody's just working on on creating cool scripts, and uh, I think the similar thing will happen, creating cool cards and and cards we can all benefit from. Yeah, and and an awful lot of VMware, um, especially into smaller um, organizations, gets get, gets implemented, gets gets shipped by. Um, sort of one, two-person shops that are, you know, selling into a particular community. It seems like this would be a great resource of best practices for them as they're trying to not only build out their practice but um, but uh, improve the uh, cu the customer experience. I think it actually goes into the larger shops as well. Um, we've talked to a number of you know. If you a number of our clients, clients who are even larger environments and what would be considered a relatively large VMware shops, um, are struggling with getting the information and being able to uh, work with the settings. DRS being a great example. Um, I remember one meeting we had where um, the admin is going to try to modify the default settings of the DRS, but there are so many variables that it's very difficult for one individual to optimize the whole environment and, as Frank mentioned, um, consider all the implications of what they do on the ecosystem. So it's not just I'm dealing with this one single VM. Because of the abstraction and the shared infrastructure, you really have to understand um, the issues that are going to cascade out of what you're doing. Um, so for even a larger shop, it's actually even probably more valuable to have the ability to um, to leverage a community and to get that kind of information as they try to optimize and use these tools. Yeah, I, I, I keep coming back to the, the notion of SSD, which has been so, um, it's gotten so much visibility. I mean, IBM just bought the oldest um, <laughs> uh, uh, solid state disk company, I think, yep. uh, in Texas existence, memory. Texas Memory. Um, um, in, in recognition, I mean, they had, and, and Texas Memory has a variety of, of different uh, uh, formats, different, uh, different offerings, but there are so many different places where you can interject solid state disk or flash into the environment, and each one has its own sort of implications, right? And each yep. one has, uh, and, and may have downstream benefits or may have downstream create downstream problems absolutely a and when you if you could marry that up against uh, sort of pricing data uh, it's it starts to it starts to customers should be able to make much more informed decisions I think this is all about making more informed decisions yeah good let me uh, let me open it up um, again for questions to the community anyone else have a question for uh, uh, for Yakum or for Nathan? Or uh, this is Scott Well, I've got you know hey, my Scott. pretty much my standard my standard question these days is is how are you know organizational CIOs that you that you talk to um, how are they looking at this product and, and and what kinds of um, activities in their environment are they hoping that will be streamlined or negated 
Um, and basically, what's their what's their goal for an ultimate outcome? Um, so, so this is John. Um, yet, uh, what we're finding is a reflection, I think, of uh, Noemi's statement, which is um, by having this a, a access to more of a global uh, uh, set of data and, and data scientists who are trying to uh, continuously interpret the data as it relates specifically to your environment, it, it leads to just better decision making, um, where the notion of relying on um, market-wide uh, operational insights and how that might affect your environment in terms of uh, cost, uh, risk, and waste, I, I think that's, that's the ambition of cloud physics, and I think it bubbles up to the CIO by seeing greater efficiencies and greater effectiveness in the overall operation uh, of the infrastructure. And by operation, I mean I mean that comprehensively it, from dealing with vendors and how you efficiently uh, understand and procure the right products and then how you uh, implement those products um, in the, the best possible way um, and do that in a rapid cycle driven by a, a kind of collective intelligence um, that doesn't mean uh, you have a reliance just on the one overloaded individual who, who simply doesn't have the time and is operating under intense pressures. But the CIO, I think, just sees just greater effectiveness and speed out of um, what he commands. So basically, it's a, it's a more efficient use of IT resources, but it's faster time to market, things like that. Potentially faster time to market. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so, John, a couple of times you've mentioned the cards and uh, the submission of cards and the uploading of massive amounts of data. If someone wants to share um, share their data with you or wants to suggest a card, what do they do? So today um, you can register uh, on our site. You can use uh, a limited set of cards that we have developed in conjunction with the community. So um, these are community big hug cards that anybody can have access to? Yes. Okay. So we have this online. You can see that there are hundreds of cards being suggested that um, we're in the process of sorting through with the assistance of the community as to prioritization and uh, co-development. Um, we have not announced any of our pricing or packaging around any of this. Um, we're going to be doing that in the course of next week with um, VMworld, <coughs> and which is where we're really publicly presenting the company and the work we're doing. Um, the data sharing mechanism I mentioned um, has not been implemented at this stage, and instead uh, what happens is your data is anonymized uh, so that neither cloud physics nor uh, trusted third parties at this time can actually share uh, data with one another in its unmasked state without explicitly engaging uh, cloud physics as an intermediary. That is um, the process that of, of doing that um, we are working on and will be implementing so that cloud physics is removed as that intermediary for the purposes of sharing your data with a, another third party. Um, and um, for what we're doing with that primarily is working with a small number of uh, storage vendors <coughs> to allow for the pre-sales process to operate far more effectively. Um, so in this case, um, if uh, let's say an SSD vendor is uh, wanting to engage an end user of cloud physics, um, that storage vendor has to uh, talk directly to and call up um, their prospective customer who uh, grants access uh, to their unmasked view, in which case uh, Cloud Physics then receives the key from that end user and allows the third party, the storage vendor, to then look at that um, that customer's uh, data set in its unmasked form. We're in the process of removing that manual step in between uh, to allow access to the currently anonymized data. And, and so where is all this data kept, John? So physically, if Sol runs out of EC2, um, and uh, it's 
it sits in a massive HBase cluster that runs out of EC2 at this stage. Okay. Um, and and you're keeping multiple copies of the data? Yeah, by HBase standards, um, you can define within HBase how many copies for redundancy are, are kept. Um, there's actually a running debate uh, that we're engaging the community with as to how many copies are necessary, um, as, as well as uh, how much history people want to deeply access, uh, because uh, the backend storage system is in and of itself um, a major systems challenge that um, we've worked on that involves a tiering mechanism such that the user experience for analyzing more recent data can be delivered um, in, in rapid form with uh, very low latencies. And data that goes back in history um, needs to be moved off that more performance tier onto a, a not an archive, but a, a slower, less expensive tier. So we, we're challenged by many of the same challenges that our end users are. Um. Well, I, I appreciate the perspective. Um, uh, just as a reminder, we're here talking about harnessing crowd uh, wisdom for the future of virtualization. And we have Duncan Epping, Frank Deniman uh, from VMware on the, on the phone with us. We have Nathan Smith from Centered Networks and, and Joachim Hepner from Sanofi, as well as John Blumenthal from Cloud Physics um, and Noemi Graysdorf, VP of Strategy and Alliances at Cambridge Computer Services. So we've got quite a, quite a group here, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the sort of the last word or last comments um, to, to Joachim and Nathan because they're, they're the practitioners there in the field. You know, what do you hope to see from the likes of cloud physics or other, or other organizations in terms of helping you improve your operating environments? What are, what are the next steps? Um, this is Nathan. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Nathan. <laughs> go ahead, Nathan. Then we'll go to Yakum. Um, I, I, I was going to say, really, I'd probably echo the um, things that have been said already, which is, for me, it's really three things. One um, is being able to simulate those changes so we can look at the outcome of the change before we actually have to touch anything in production. Um, the second one would be being able to carry out proof of concept without actually doing a proof of concept. Because um, I think, as Naomi mentioned earlier, um, even if you can run a proof of concept, trying to get that to match your real-world data is impossible. It doesn't matter how many hours you spend trying to simulate that workload, that you just can't simulate it. So being able to take a real workload and uh, run it that way is huge. And then for, for us particularly, this uh, idea of simplifying everything down to the, the cards that we keep talking about, where we can very easily and, and not just someone who's technical, but even someone who isn't technical can log into a portal and see a kind of almost traffic light system of green and red. You know, um, is your HA set up properly? Here are the 10 things you should be doing with your HA. And you can just check through, or rather, you know, the card will look for you and see whether you're matching those up. So they would be the three things that we're most excited about. Great. And Yakum? Yeah, no, I agree with Nathan. Uh, you know, again, some of the big things, you know, in the future as the virtualized environments get larger and more complicated, it's going to be much easier to go to an external resource like this and try to simulate uh, changes we might make in the environment or, you know, if we want to grow it even further. Um, also, from a troubleshooting point of view, you know, I see that being helpful again as, you know, as other people run into this issue. Are we unique with this problem? You know, before we go down the road of opening a case, you know, just again, this whole notion of self-service and, and looking at the community for help with some of the more complicated items uh, is a good thing. Great. And uh, just as a reminder, so Cloud Physics website did open up yesterday to the world. Um, Cloud Physics is going to be at VM World. Um, and um, uh, you're exhibiting, what's your booth number there, John? Um, we'll actually be exhibiting from the Fusion I.O. booth. Um, Fusion I.O. is one of our strong partners. Um, so as a startup, they have been gracious enough to um, allow us to exhibit out of their booth. Okay. And uh, so submit your cards, uh, submit your data, um, and 
and help influence the community and make this a giant group hug. Uh, so again, I'm John MacArthur. I'm here with Noemi Graysdorf, uh, Peer Insight. Uh, in advance of uh, VMworld, harnessing crowd wisdom for the future of virtualization, I want to thank uh, Scott Lowe, Mike Alvarado, David Floyer for their questions. Um, also, Nathan Smith and Joachim Hepner, thank you very much for your time uh, today. Noemi Graysdorf, thanks for making the trek into the studio with thanks. me. Thanks. Nice to see you again. Duncan Epping and Frank Deniman, you get the, uh, the, the uh, late night award. I, well, I guess it's not that bad. It's 6 o'clock, so, or 7 o'clock there. So, so uh, th thanks, for, uh, thanks for dialing in and being part of today's um, Peer Insight. With that, uh, yeah, um, if you can, uh, at uh, VMworld, uh, please watch the live um, streaming uh, coverage of VMworld on uh, SiliconANGLE TV. Uh, the, the Cube will be live there at VMworld and uh, have a number of Wikibon analysts there on site doing lots of executive interviews. So please uh, join them on SiliconANGLE TV. Um, we will have uh, research notes up um, uh, 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 by the end of the week uh, on today's call and you can uh, replay the audio uh, on the Wikibon site or watch a restream of the video uh, on SiliconANGLE TV. Uh, forward slash Wikibon. Uh, oh, sorry, on peer on uh, on Silicon Angle TV. My apologies. We keep moving things. So um, again, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm John MacArthur at uh, Peer Insights here at Wikibon. Have a great day. <laughs>